All right. In, in our wisdom, the conference organizers have very strategically saved uh, one of the most powerful and exciting programs for the very end, when uh, those of you who have been able to stick around will uh, be richly rewarded for having done so. Um, as the panel comes to the stage, I'll just quickly introduce them and then uh, turn the time over to Jane Marks, our moderator. Uh, and and uh, it, during this session, as in all others, of course, we encourage you to put questions or comments into the chat uh, on the online platform, uh, and then um, you'll be invited to, uh, to come forward and, and make your comments if you wish to do so in person. Uh, so our panel moderator is Jane Marks. Um, she's joined on the stage by Alex Freeman, Richard Gallagher, Robert Kiley, and Wilhelm Widmark uh, for our discussion on innovating to deliver open access. Jane? Thank you, and thank you very much. It's so nice to see so many people here in the room, and I know there's also lots of people online who have uh, who've stayed around to uh, join us for this session. Um, I'm joined by a great panel, um, different stakeholders here representing this topic, and we want this to be a really forward-looking session. Um, we want to take the opportunity to explore some of the innovation that's going out there, talk a little bit about some of the incentives and the barriers, um, and we are going to get straight into the debate. So, um, oh sorry, not the debate, the panel. So let, let's start with some innovations. Um, Richard, do you want to talk about some of the things that you're seeing? Um, you mentioned them earlier, but what, what are you seeing that's driving change? Thanks, Jane. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Since I mentioned subscribe to open earlier, I won't mention it again, except to say that um, there are now 17 uh, different publishers um, engaged in uh, converting their journals to open access using subscribe to open. A uh, total of 151 journals in 2023 are aiming for um, that status, including 51 from annual reviews. But the thing about Subscribe to Open that I wanted to pick on as a, an interesting innovation is that um, there is a community of practice uh, which involves um, librarians, funders, researchers, publishers, anyone who's interested getting together and talking about uh, what the issues are, what our common goals are, what our problems are. And I think it's a really um, positive model for how we all need to work together um, and how we all need to really become much more embedded in each other's um, goals and points of view. Uh, so I think that's something that um, if anyone would like to join it, we have meetings on the first Thursday of every month. Um, and it really is, uh, I, I've learned an awful lot from the people that are uh, participating in that event. And we all openly share our experiences um, with the other participants. Another innovation that I think that we need to grasp is um, open access is all well and good, but it isn't necessarily making information as widely available as, as, as it possibly could be, uh, because scientific publications are uh, very particular and particularly dense and inaccessible uh, ways to present information. And I think there's an opportunity for the publishing community to seize a role as a bridge between research progress and civil society as a whole. Um, we're doing this in a number of ways, uh, annual reviews, and we'd love to partner with other publishers um, to, uh, to, to uh, get more um, information out to the public. Uh, there's so much uh, disinformation, deliberate disinformation in, in some cases, uh, misunderstanding, misinformation on all kinds of topics. Uh, there's great science available. Much of it is becoming open access, but that's not enough. We also need to make it accessible to the community as a whole. Um, one last thing, if I could yeah. mention it. Um, having spent the last four or five years mostly just working on a business model to move to open access for our company. And I'm sure at all companies, um, uh, people are working on their own models. Similarly, funders are thinking very deeply about how they support um, uh, open science. And libraries are thinking about what the best route is for them to get involved in open science. 
it's great that there's all these diff different initiatives, but I think it's very time consuming and it's, it's not really the best use of our time. So I hope that we'll revert back to some common model that we can all, uh, that we can all share. And I wanted to mention a model that I've come across and um, that I think it, it um, bears some um, examination. It's by a chap called John Walensky, who's a researcher at Stanford University, and he's written a book called Copyright's Broken Promise, How to Restore the Law's Ability to Promote the Progress of Science. And he's basically uh, advocating for a reform of the copyright law in the United States along the lines of the Music Modernization Act, which has really uh, helped greatly in the uh, support of music performers um, in, in the last uh, uh, 10, or 12 years or so. Um, I think uh, it's possible that here's a model that you know, we could all um, coalesce around and, and that might make it might give us the opportunity and the time to focus on other uh, things that are potentially more impactful and more important than just um, working out how to fund um, open science. Thank you, Richard. So let's go to the library community. Wilhelm, what are you saying in innovation? Well, it's interesting the last thing you said, because we have now in Sweden, we have the EU presidency, and we are discussing in the Council conclusions between the member states that we do, must do something about copyright to move this forward. But that is not the library community. But the library community, we are working on different solutions. As I'm representing a big library and I'm representing the consortium in Sweden. So we work in the consortium on how we have had a group for two years now working on beyond, beyond, beyond the transformative agreements with researchers, founders, university management, and people from the licensing side, and have had really great discussions on how to move the way forward. So that is one way. Then at Stockholm University, we say that we can't just sit here and talk. We have to act as well. So we have started to work with um, a little start of company that are working on a publishing platform that we pilot together with it, the platform, with the company, and try to get our researchers to try out the platform. Because I think it's really important to have the researcher in making the platform to start using the platform. And then we need to talk about the incentives and the awards <laughs> and everything. But that's some of the parts we are doing. Thank you. And, and this is a good segue, actually, over oh, to Oh, perfect segue. You could have made that. We didn't rehearse that. <laughs> so those of you who don't know me, which is probably most of you, I'm director of Octopus, which is a, a new platform uh, currently funded by UKRI. And we are, very much, uh, we are very much that. So I'm interested in thinking about what is research actually all about and what is the best way, then, to communicate that. And research isn't about writing a journal article. Research is about advancing understanding of the world. But of course, it's no point advancing understanding if you're not communicating that to other people. So I'm interested in thinking about innovations that can really serve the purpose of getting research done well and then communicated well. And so tackling some of those tricky incentive questions that, um, that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. How can the way that we communicate research drive best research practice? And so how can we completely rethink how we communicate in order to reset that incentive structure? So that's, that's what Octopus is designed to do. And I'm really excited by lots of the innovations like registered reports and some of um, research equals and some of the other innovations that are very different ways of thinking about how to communicate research in order to drive better incentives. But how do you get the researchers to use the platform? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a researcher myself, so I, I know that problem. Um, it is, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Um, you know, people say, I will publish there when other people publish there. 
But I think this is about everybody moving at once. We've all got to all the different parts of the, the community, whether that's researchers or funders or publishers, um, we've all got to think about how can we help everybody take a step to something that's better and that's new. Um, and so I think that that is not impossible. I think there are benefits for every part of the community to changing the way that we do things. And so I hope that everybody can see advantages and move together. Um, and I think we have to make it a, a place where researchers can trust that what they publish in new platforms will be recognized by funders, will be recognized by their institutions, won't be lost into the internet. So all of these things we've got to think about. And then we've got to communicate it to them um, and help them try these platforms out and move to them. But I think it takes everybody, everybody moving to, at once. Thank you. I am going to turn to Robert next. But before I do that, I just want to invite those online or in the room, please put your questions in the chat, because we want to have some interaction as we go through this. We don't want to get to the end and say any questions. So please put your questions in, particularly at the moment, on if you've got any ideas about innovations that you'd like to talk about. But Robert, what are you seeing as a funder in terms of innovation that gets you excited? Hmm. <coughs> I'll pause there. I w oh, let me just tackle the... Um incentive thing because I do think at the moment that trying to introduce innovation until we really seriously address the research evaluation issue mm -hmm. is like trying to do something you know trying to tie your shoelace up with one hand tied behind your back it's too difficult and I think the so what gives me hope however is I think there is a move now to try to recognize that when doing a research assessment there is more than just a research article and actually encouraging or scholarly outputs, whether it's a data note um, uh, or a peer review report, should be considered as part of the research evaluation. So I think if we can, if we can um, really get that, get researchers to believe that, and because we implement, we actually deliver on that, then I think there's, you know, there's hope for these for these innovative models. But I think there are other. I mean, that said, I think there are already some really promising signs. Um, when I was at Welcome, we, we launched the, the F1000 Welcome Open Research Platform, which moved to a slightly different model of publishing in terms of you publish first and you do your, your peer review post-publication, and you encourage the sharing of all, of all research outputs. So I say it was research articles, but it was sort of data notes, and, and they also developed this concept of like a genome note, um, which is quite innovative in a sense of, really, it was really just publishing the sequence with a little bit of description. This is a uh, the grey squirrel or whatever. And what's really innovative about that is that they're trying to find a way, F1000 are trying to find a way working with the Sanger Institute, is can, we, can we actually automate some of the peer review? Because the real peer review here is, can I reassemble this genome from the, from the, from the, from the article? Because it's not really an article about lots of text, it's really just pointed to the, the data. So I think, I think we're at the, I've seen some innovation there. I think the, the model eLife uh, are really pushing is probably the, the single, again, a, a really good illustration of where the future might lie. And I, one thing I was trying to make clear this morning, I think if we, if we don't want to keep using journal names and impact factors, which we all say we don't, but we, we're all a bit lazy and it's just a bit easier sometimes to use that, then we need to find another way. And I think one of the things like the eLife assessment tries to do, it, so it's like a peer, you know, it's a, it's a respected individual, as it were, who, who is assessing a piece of research and making that public. It can be signed or otherwise. But what I like about the eLife assessment is that they try to uh, identify at the article level its significance and, uh, and its strength. So, you know, is it, is it groundbreaking and does the data they've, they've presented support the conclusions? And I think that could be... A, you know, a good proxy, because I think it's unrealistic, as I said earlier, it's unrealistic to assume that people, um, tenure uh, review panels or grant giving panels, are going to have the time to read all research articles, or going to have the expertise to understand it. So we want proxies, and if there's a respected editor who says this is groundbreaking, and the evidence is really strong, that's probably quite a good good proxy. So I think that published review uh, uh, curate model has got, has got real strength. And then finally, I would say, I think we've seen a real 
growth in support for Diamond. The idea that we have a community, uh, you know, where, where it's free to publish, free to free to read, and it's owned and controlled by the by the scholar community. So I think there are some really positive signs. Can I disagree with Robert on that? I don't think we do want proxies. I think we want to, we want, I mean, maybe everything's got to be a proxy, but I think we do need metrics because, as you say, we can't realistically expect review panels to read everything. But I think we need those metrics to be thought out such that they are not proxies. They really capture what we mean by quality. So there are things that I think we can define that we mean by quality. Is this reproducible from the method that is written here? That is a, an actual metric which could be rated and could be a quality metric. So I don't think we need to resort to proxies. I think we can find metrics that are actual metrics of quality if we work on it. Okay, any, any contributions from the room or online? We have one down here. trying to type it in, but I can't type that quickly. Um, I'd love to hear the panel's view on creating incentives for reproducing work, your own or other people's, because at the moment there is an active disincentive for reproducing work. You're not going to get it, it published in all likelihood, which in itself is a, almost an incentive for bad behavior. Ooh, yeah. Who wants to take can that I really can I jump question. in? Yeah, no, this, this is close to my heart. Um, I think it's really important that what gets published is not judged on the findings and the outcomes, but it's judged on the quality of how the research is done. I mean, Octopus has one solution to that, which is breaking up the concept of an article and a published paper, and instead it publishes smaller units, as does F1000. Um, but I think that if we get away from the fact that what we care about, apparently, is data and findings, and actually move to what we care about is high quality, then it doesn't matter whether that's potentially a small data set, which on its own is not you know, robust. It could be reproduced or re replicated analysis, reproduced data collection. All of these things are incredibly valuable when they're put into the whole um, and may not stand as valuable on their own. I think all of these things need to be recognized for the intrinsic quality of the work rather than just the findings. So I think it's really important that we move away from judging work on just the outcomes and the findings and more to judging it on how well it was done. And then it's scholarly communication again. The science is the communication. You can follow the communications. Mm. So that's, I'm going to turn to Richard now, because that's a really interesting one. If we're going to value the quality of the research and not the final output, how would, how would publishers respond to that challenge? Can I tell you something? I'm almost <laughs> totally do. deaf. Oh. Um, I, I thought I was going to be okay. I travel, I just got back from India on Thursday, and I had a uh, ear infection when I was there that cleared up, but um, it got worse on the plane, and now I'm you can't almost hear. so you, okay. you'll okay. need to tell me again. The I'll re repeat the question. So, so, the question was if we're looking at quality and we're looking at quality of output from researchers, then that quality should be judged on what the quality of the actual research, not the findings. And so, the challenge there for publishers is the publisher tends to chase the novelty and the um, interesting output, by definition, perhaps, the impact factor. So how would the publishers respond to that challenge? Um, I don't think publishers have got a good way of um, identifying quality. And there's all manner of um, metrics that need to be included when you judge the, the value of output. Um, so uh, I, I think that what we need to do is not try and find the one perfect answer, but to try and have, to try and have a skeptical, inclusive um, uh, set of, of metrics that we use to judge quality. Um, ultimately, um, since I, I work for a review publisher, I think that time 
will sort out what was high quality and what wasn't. And um, you know, there's uh, all kinds of possibility for errors to be published and be thought of mm -hmm. as quality and so on. And you know, um, over the course of time, science uh, is self-correcting because people repeat work, things look a bit out of place, and and um, some high-profile stuff is revisited. Um, obviously, when something is first published, the more novel and exciting it looks, the more attention it gets. But it doesn't always stand the test of time. But you have to give it time to find out. Very good point. Let's go on to talk a little bit about um, how do we get um, the different stakeholders in this process to really engage with change and innovation. I think, I think it's fair to say that the scholarly communication process has been entrenched in a certain way that it's done for a very long time. Um, and that is, you know, that both from the researcher to the publisher to the librarian. So how do we, as the different stakeholders, um, respond to those challenges for change? Robert, can I turn to you first? <coughs> uh, yes, of course you can. Um, one thing that struck me from yesterday's panel discussion, um, the researcher was on, was on the panel, and he was um, bemoaning the fact that it may be difficult for his his junior, uh, his early career researchers, to publish in Science, Nature and Cell. He listed those three journals, and if Ben's in the, in the room now. And, and that just seems like just a crazy, crazy world. Why, why does it matter where it's published? It's, it's the, you know, if we found a cure for whatever, that's the key thing, not the fact it's got a nature or cell brand on it. So, but this comes back to my point, we need to persuade the research community, because obviously that research in all, you know, was completely genuine, that he felt that his researchers will only get rewarded in terms of tenure or, or grants if they have a CNS publication. And until we can demonstrate that that really is not the case, then we're going to be stuck in this forever loop. And, you know, no disrespect to my colleagues from Springer Nature, but they will end up creating nature, water, nature, screen, nature, whatever, forever. So we need to, if we really are serious about this, we need to be absolutely clear that it is not the brand of the journal what counts, it is the research. And the work sort of like, like, like Alex is doing to try and measure it, whether it's reproducible, will be absolutely key to that. Alex, definitely over to you next. Oh. How do you persuade How? a researcher <laughs> that that is not as important? Well, if somebody had the answer to that, then uh, I really want to hear it. I mean, it is important, that's the problem. It's not a matter of persuading them that it's not important, it's making it not important. So I think it's beholden to the institutions and the funders, the people who hold the researchers' careers in their hands, not to look at the publication list and go, where's nature, cell, and science, but to say, where's the good work that this person's been doing? What have they been doing, and how high quality is it? Um, and again, I think, you know, that comes down to it's not just the findings, it's the methods and the thought behind it. Um, so I think until we tackle research assessment, until we tackle better metrics, we are up against a really hard wall there. But on the other hand, uh, you know, I'm a researcher, I have a research team, I talk to researchers all the time. They want this new world. They don't want to be judged on whether they've only published in nature or science. They know that that's not best for the work that they're doing. Um, so they're very keen to explore. Um, a lot of people are keen to try new platforms, try new things. They have to have their safety net. So they can use Octopus, say, or other pub platforms like a preprint server, and then publish things there, but keep their powder dry, and also back up, publish in a journal that will get them recognized for sure in their career path. And that's a, like a hybrid point, but it's a good hybrid point, and I think it should be encouraged, and then that gets them trying out new platforms. But I think we need to sort out research assessment, and we need to sort out metrics before we can expect researchers to take a leap in the dark, because it's their careers on the line. I mean, if it were your career, what would you be doing? So, Wilhelm, how do institutions sort that out? <laughs> That's really hard, but I think <clears throat> what is important now, the discussion is really ongoing. We have Quara, we have people working for it, but it will take time. It, it will take a lot of time. Meanwhile, we need to keep the discussion going, and I think it's problematic now that we have many different strategies that don't align. So as long as we have 
all different strategies and we don't work together, it gets very hard. So we need to have those conversations, how we can align our strategies. For instance, the different university associations could talk together and have a strategy. Now Luere has one, EOA has one. So it's really important to work together. We have the same goal, but we are mm -hmm. doing it different ways. You need to do some different ways, but talk together. Mm -hmm. Talking is important, and we have a question in the room. Aaron, do you want to come and ask your question? Actually, I have um, one comment to make first, and then I ask the question. Sorry about that. So, one of the interesting experiences I ever worked with was launching a new publishing platform in the desert in Qatar, uh, as some of you might remember. And I usually share stories about that privately and not publicly. But one of the reasons why, in the end, we didn't manage to take off in 2010, and it was open access, it was open access planned, was we didn't get the funded researchers to publish on the platform, and the funder basically ran out of steam and out of patience uh, to, um, to keep funding that, because it takes a long time. So that's taking me back to my pre-Springer Nature days, um, which is really interesting. But I wanted to ask, um, this is the researcher to reader question. So I would like to bring the reader into the room as we can. So how do we signal to the reader which, re which research is really important to read, especially since we have a lot of uh, readers who have English as a second, third, or fourth language, so they know which article is worth reading and worth the time so they don't waste the time and we can actually advance science for that. Thank you. Great question, Aaron. I'm going to come straight to you, Richard. I'll repeat the question. Oh, okay. So, how do we signal to readers in this world where there is so much content out there and perhaps we don't look at the title of the journal? How do we signal to readers what is important and what, what, what's quality and value for them to read? Well, they have to do that for themselves. Um, and. Um, I, yeah, I just think, yeah. I, do you mean scientists or do you mean non-scientists? Well, I, I suppose scientists. Sci um, scientists. I think one of the, it, people are so familiar with the area that they work on that they'll know pretty quickly what is important work and, and what is uh, uh, less important. I think it's a bigger problem. We talk so much about interdisciplinary research and um, research that cuts across all kinds of different fields. There really is a problem there in being able to understand and identify the most important work in an area that you might want to um, uh, start working with. And then, you know, I think you just use a review. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Um, so we have a question from Phil in the room. So we talked a little, you guys talked a little earlier on about um, measuring quality, right? So not having proxies around impact factor or journal titles or whatever it happens to be, but how do you measure the quality of an article? Now there are frameworks that have emerged around reproducibility, for example, and they are not whether the article will be reproduced, whether it's actually correct, but whether it contains enough information to be able to be reproduced, whether somebody else could try it again without phoning the author and, and asking them for the details or going to see them do the experiment or whatever it is. And there is at least one startup that I know of that's using AI to look at articles and give them a score for their reproducibility. And it's tested pretty well when compared to people looking through it by hand and, 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 and that sort of approach. So I was wondering what the panel thought about the, uh, is there opportunity to use technology like AI, for example, to create metrics that look at quality, or whether this is uh, you know, something that will always have to be just something that's done by hand and by eye. So, Robert, what do you think? I mean, how would, how would a funder look at those kinds of metrics? Well, let me try and uh, just tackle the answer the, the question directly. I mean, I think, uh, so we want the research to be reproducible. Uh, and there was a, the, the Council of Reproducibility 
study or something that was called, where um, a group of people took the, the, the most cited, I think it was, the most cited um, cancer articles over the last sort of 10 years, and they picked a subset of them, and they tried to see whether or not they could reproduce the, 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 the experiment to see if they get the, the data. And they, I can't remember the whole details of the thing, but the key conclusion from that was that the method section was just too, uh, it was just not detailed enough for anyone to go about trying to reproduce it. So they did end up having to get on the phone to say, well, what did you do? Did you, what species, you know, was it, was it male or female with a mouse? Was it on a Friday afternoon? A whole raft of things they had to go and check. So I do think, you know, the idea that you can have a, a research paper and a method be, you know, limited by print days where you've got like two paragraphs, it's just crazy. So in an online world, we should have, you know, absolutely full uh, methods. And it may be in a separate paper, I think that's what Alex might say. It's, <laughs> that's why we talk about the fair data and how we can do it. Mm. And there we need also to have people supporting the researchers at the institutions to make the data fair and to make it reproducible. So it's, it's we need, <laughs> The institutions have to work on that to help the researchers mm -hmm. doing. Alex? Okay. Well, I was just going to say that that particular AI failed miserably on one of my papers, which was completely open, had open data, and, and the AI said, no, no, it's got no open data, and I'd linked to the data. But, um, so I wouldn't trust it at the moment. But in concept, I think, you know, there are things that we can score on that are reproducibility aspects. But I would just get the peer reviewers to do it rather than rely on AI. They've got to read the damn thing, so they might as well tick the box. And they should look at the data as well. Exactly, they should be, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to turn a little bit now to barriers because, you know, first of all, we have to create incentives, but we also have barriers, some practical, some, you know, just institutional, if you like. So, um, Robert, what do you see an, as barriers to moving forward? To particularly, let's focus on inclusivity and how can we make any new um, open future more inclusive? Yeah, obviously, you know, equity and inclusivity is a really, really important issue. Um, I think, and I think we should address it. I think we should not pretend, however, that the current like subscription system is a beacon of equity and uh, an opportunity. I mean, the current system is is unequal. E obviously, we don't want to build a system which is equally um, uh, in inequitable. So, I think you know, one obvious solution are things like, like Diamond, as we've mentioned, that has a growing call for, you know, uh, and a number of funders are, are actively getting behind. There was a Diamond Action Plan. I just looked at it before I came on, on up here, and I think about a dozen research funders have expressly committed to that Diamond Action Plan. But it, it's, it, it, you know, it is, it's a huge challenge, and I don't, I don't pretend to know the answers. So, anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, on yeah. no, go, go on. on. We'll, no? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, equity isn't just about funding. There should be nothing holding back a researcher other than their own talent and hard work. And I think there are so many barriers, things like was mentioned already, the English language being a barrier. We know we have really good uh, automatic translation tools now that are only going to get better. We should be using them. We, shouldn't be, we should have language agnostic platforms where you can read and write in your own native language. We should at least be planning for them even if we don't trust them 100%. You should be able to flick between the translation and the English version. There should be you know, all sorts of things where we're trying to remove sources of bias. We talked about bias in peer review already um, today. You know, we should be removing institutional cues from papers so that, you know, when you're reading a paper, you're not going, oh, it's from this institution, therefore I trust it. It's challenging you to actually look at the content of the paper and see whether you trust it. Um, so I think there's lots of things that we can do, and we should be using as much technology as we can to do that to re reduce these barriers. Can I say just one other thing I meant, I meant to add? I mean, we, we've tended to assume that open access equals APCs, and I think that you know, and there's a lot of people now doing work to try and disentangle those two. But even if we do, in some future, continue to use APCs, I think we should explore whether it's like a purchasing power parity option. So at the moment, most publishers, and I'm happy to be corrected here, have like a standard APC. You might get it waived, 
but if you're contributing, you're, it's, you know, it's the APC, and I just wonder why there hasn't been any sort of greater um, exploration of, of, you know, so if you're in the rich north, yeah, you are maybe paying the $3,000, $5,000, whatever it is, but if you're not in a rich north, then you pay proportionate to your purchasing power. So I think exploring that would be quite helpful. Did you want to come in on that one, Richard? Well, or I, I can hear yeah, what sorry, you're saying, yeah. but I can hear yeah. what okay. <laughs> So we, we were just talking about, are there models out there that allow for um, not just a straight waiver, but different pricing points, depending on where you are in the world? I know there are some um, publishers or some journals that do that. Um, APCs were very important, and Coalition S was very important in breaking through the logjam and, and getting things moving on open access, but I don't think, and I don't know whether you think that APCs are really a good solution. I mean, I think possibly we need to move on and look at different ways, and I don't think that read and publish agreements are particularly um, um, sustainable or, or easy to manage either. Um, obviously, I think subscribe to open is a good model, but I'm not suggesting that it's the answer to all our problems. That's one of the, that's one of the issues, really, is that we do need to find this uh, fair and easy model that, um, uh, that we can all buy into. And I'm not sure what that is, but there's lots of models from other publishers out there that look pretty good. Um, Wilhelm wants to come back on that. Bernie, do you want to go to the microphone for when he's finished? Well, I think this is really important. I'm representing a consortium as well. And we have this system now. We are in the middle. We try to have innovative ways with different platforms and <coughs> other ways we subscribe to open. But still, we need to work with the publishing houses to, we, within the consortia, we have to negotiate for new deals. But I think here we need to have a cooperation between the consortia and the publishers to be open to discuss other ways. Then I think we should leave the transformative agreements. That is a new business model. It will just continue. We need to be open to discuss other ways. And I, I think we need to move away from the APCs and talk about publishing as a service and things like that. But it's really, we're in the middle of a transition and we need good discussions between the consortia and the publishers. Thank you. Bernie, over to you. Thank you. Bernie Folan OASPA. Um, so I want to kind of take us away from publishing for a moment. Um, and before I ask this question, this is about research ideas. Um, I should acknowledge that this kind of idea predates PIDs, researcher IDs, institutional IDs. It's, an, it's a conversation I had many, many years ago after learning that, many, that institutions, things may well have changed. Many, there's, there's not a consensus about how we gather information about what research is ongoing. So I'm talking about when that first, um, you know, the first day that that research is, is starts in an institution. I'm not interested really in whether a publication derives from it or whether even the PhD or whatever the award is awarded. But it, we, we, I'd like to know what the panel, if the panel think there's any value in tracking ideas so that we can see cross-disciplinarily and, and globally what, what's upcoming, what's forthcoming in terms of um, the things that are piquing researchers' interest and this, I, and I should also acknowledge that when I saw Octopus, I was ex extremely excited because finally, you know, moving these things apart is, I think, huge progress. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. <laughs> um, well, yes, as, as Bernie probably knows, the Octopus, one of the publication types, is a research problem, and another publication type is a, is an, a theory or an idea of how that problem might be solved. And so, in a way, that is kind of tracking what is piquing researchers' interests. But I think that defining the problems is sometimes the hardest bit of solving a problem. Um, so, you know, these things are research outputs in their own right, and people should be getting the credit for them. So I think these are all ways of 
not only kind of building a knowledge graph of what's piquing people's interest and what's being done, but actually giving people credit for some of the hard bits of research, which is defining problems, coming up with theories. Alison. Thanks, Alison Maddock from PLOS. I'd just like to go back to the global issues we were talking about just now. Um, I think part of that's about business model, but I think it's about much more than that when we're thinking about how to truly create a pathway for open science that's not only global, but fully, fully equitable. I was at the, um, the recent open science conference in the UN a couple of weeks ago, and it was interesting there hearing from researchers from Africa, Latin America, Asia, representing different organizations, absolutely zero support for APCs in any way, shape, or form. So from their perspective, it is very clear that AP any APC-based model is a non-starter. But I think equally importantly related to that, and this was made very clearly by Ariana, who represents the, the Brazilian consortium, who've sort of you know, done so much with, AP, with um, open access in Latin America, that another key issue for them is around who owns, who has the control. And so I fear when I sort of listen to conversations like this and we're talking about how we transition our systems, the publishers we have, the infrastructure we have, that from equity in a global perspective, we're still talking about a locus of control that sits somewhere other than with local researchers. And I'm just wondering how panelists might think about the ways in which that has to fundamentally shift if we really want true global equity in open science. Robert, would you like to pick that one up? Can I say no? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. I think that's the best answer. Um, I'm not sure I f fully, can you, fully got the question. Okay. So, Have a go. So, at so I'm going to try and summarize, Alison. You can thumbs up or thumbs down. It, it's really, how do, we, how do we come up with a, or how do we ma manage a system, a global system, where researchers aren't always um, in charge of their destiny, if you like, and how research output is managed in their area. So, you know, I mean, I think one question really for an organization like Coalition S is to what extent can you help communication around the world between different um, uh, funder groups, different um, government groups, I think, and, and research drivers to, to make sure that the solutions we come up with really do work for, for scientists on the ground. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if I knew all the answers to this, I wouldn't be stood here. Would I be head of the UN or something? Richard, do you want to you butt yeah, I in? I want to make a suggestion, and that's a DAO, D-A-O, which is a decentralized, autonomous organization. What we really need is much more inclusion. We're talking a lot about equity, but we also, and we talk about diversity, but there's not much opportunity for inclusion. All of us here are representatives of a fairly narrow spectrum. And uh, what a DAO is, is that it's a collaborative structure that uses blockchain to gather and deploy information from large scattered groups of people. Um, for instance, there's one on Ukraine relief. Um, there's other ones that are popping up um, to guide biotech and pharma research. Um, there's even one for science. In fact, there was a, a conference in London last month on uh, this area of, of science. So ADAO is um, it's transparent, it's member controlled, and it typically responds by voting to proposals. So this approach could be, I mean, I think of it as um, the subscribe to open community writ large. You could have um, uh, librarians from Latin America, researchers from Riga, uh, funders from the Philippines, publishers in Paris, all contributing their ideas. And I think from that, we might see emerging a consensus of something that really is um, uh, appropriate and fair for a much wider swathe of the population that we all worry about, but we don't really understand the constraints of. <clears throat> my, my sort of gut reaction, if blockchain's the answer, we've asked the wrong question, but that's just me being a, me being a cynic. Um, I think what we will will see is, is, is far more sort of um, scholar-led publishing in the future. I think we're starting to see that through like, the rise of, 
of pre-printing, so authors taking responsibility. We're seeing that through the rise of, of, of diamond models, which are owned by the scholarly community. So I think we are going to see a growth in that. I don't think there'll ever be you know, a single model. What works in Latin America may not, well work, may not work as well in, in like the, the UK or, or North America. So I think we have to have a plurality of models. Um, so we are about to be thrown off the stage, but I'm going to ask you to get your crystal balls out and give me sort of one line. What do you see in the future? Or what would you like to see in the future? Well, of course, I'd like to see everybody <laughs> using Octopus. Uh, no, I would like to see a model which has reset the incentives so that researchers are able to go with the incentives and not have to fight them with their own code of conduct and morals. Thank you. Well, um, well I hope for the future that we can get... I think the researchers own the questions, so we can get the researchers to work on the question and we can help the researchers to change the system. Richard. What's the question? What the <laughs> question is, take your crystal ball out, what would you like to see in the future? Um, I'd like the decision making to be um, spread across a much wider group of people and um, blockchain might be the answer. Mm -hmm. Robert, your, your crystal ball, what do you see in the future? So if the crystal ball is up for the next five, ten years, I think we're going to see a, a massive growth in pre-printing and the, the development of journal agnostic peer review services. So the publish, review, curate model, I think, will be the, the more immediate future. So there you have it, a very um, forward thinking, I think, um, an interesting session great stakeholder discussion here so let's hope it continues in the future and thank you very much for staying to the end i'm so impressed that nobody snuck out at the back of the room so thank you very much everyone and over to i think rick who's coming next thank you